Our topic today is losing their religion, the cause and the cure for apostasy, or in in Western Academy, from Western universities. Um, my presentation is going to be very direct, it's very honest. Um, I don't pull any punches, I don't beat around the bush, I'm a pretty straight shooter, whatever else cliche you want to use. I'm going to tell you straight up what I think is happening in these colleges and universities and what our responses and our defenses uh, should be. Um, also, whoa, that tends to happen. Um, I would say that uh, if you're 13 or younger, this lecture may not be appropriate for you. Um, it's a uh, this doesn't work. We have to go through the obligatory microphone problem. <laughs> the lecture is... The lecture is uh, rated PG-13. So. Um, parental discretion is advised. Alright. <coughs> Again. Uh, I want to begin by reiterating some of the things I said in a chutbah about a month ago here at MCC to uh, set the table, as it were, metaphysically. Um, I'm new with technology, so if I do something wrong, if I forget to switch a slide or something, please let me know. Um, I'm kind of a techno-peasant. Uh, but we need to grasp our own metaphysics. So Ibn Ajiba, who was a great metaphysician in our tradition, uh, he said that every name and title of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has three aspects that relate to his creation. And Imam al-Ghazali says something similar. He has different terminology. But the terminology of Ibn Ajiba, he calls them ta'alluq, ta'khalluq, and ta'haquq. You can translate these something like association, appropriation, or assimilation, and actualization. So for example, he says in his book on the commentary of the 99 names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says one of the names or titles of Allah is Al-Malik, he's the king. How, how does this name associate with us? Well, it's simply a uh, recognition that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the king and we are his subjects, and that's it. Right? It's, it's to be cognizant of that fact, to uh, be resigned to that fact. We might say, well, that's axiomatic, that's just self-evident. That's just a clear and distinct idea, as Descartes might say, but you'll be surprised how many people don't uh, don't are not resigned to that what we would consider to be a self-evident truth. So it's ta'adlu. And then ta'adlu, um, appropriation or assimilation. So um, how do we assimilate, as it were, this name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at our level? Well, just as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the king of everything, uh, we also must be kings of our subjects. Right? So what are our subjects? our faculties, our limbs, right? Imam al-Fazali uses the analogy in the Aja'ib al-Qalb, the one of the marvels of the heart, the wonders of the heart. He uses the analogy of the heart uh, being um, the castle in the kingdom, and there are certain inroads uh, to the heart that destroy the heart. For example, the eyes, the ears, the tongue, uh, the stomach, the genitals, the hand and the feet, these must be protected. These are our subjects. And then to hakuk is actually to master the self, right? And to truly actualize being the king of our subjects. So this is the end or the purpose or the telos of the human being on this earth is to mirror the divine names and attributes according to our metaphysicians. There's a, there's a tradition, there's weakness in it but true in its meaning, adorn yourselves with the character of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa did. Uh, in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or Rauf or Rahim. These are two divine names, but there are no definite articles. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is, as it were, a mirror of the divine attributes at a human level. Whereas Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for example, is Ar-Rahman, he is the infinitely merciful, the indiscriminately compassionate, the all-loving in an absolute sense, we should be people of Rahmah. We cannot be our Rahman, but we are people of Rahmah. 
right? We mirror this divine attribute because this is an attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is true in all Abrahamic religions, whether it's, you know, I'm talking about Fazali in Islam or Aquinas in Catholicism or Maimonides in Judaism. This is called a teleological metaphysic, an end or goal-oriented metaphysic. Now our metaphysicians identify four causes of the creation of the human being. There are four causes of the creation of the human being. The efficient cause, which is the direct force of production, and that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is al-fa'il, as Imam al-Ghazali calls him. He is a totally free agent. He has absolute volition within his nature to do what he wants. In Arabic, this is called al illatul fa'iliyah, the efficient cause. Then you have the material cause, which is the stuff or the material from which something is produced. Right? So Aquinas calls this prime matter, materia prima. What is the stuff from which um, creation is produced? Well, it's nothing. According to the Abrahamic theological positions, creation is, is ex nihilo. It is from nothing. So there is no material cause of creation. In the Quran, the Quran says, "That is the cause of you, and you are on the earth, and you have been created from before, and you have not done anything." Right? That the angel tells Zakaria, "Alayhi salam, this is easy for Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. He created you before when you were nothing. You were not one thing." How do I take this out? Okay. So, uh, modern science or Newtonian physics stops here. They only recognize efficient and material causes. So everything is just matter in motion. It is a purely mechanistic or materialistic conception of existence. Uh, but our scholars, they continue and they recognize a third cause, which is called formal cause. And this deals with the essence of that which is produced. What is it essentially? Right? It's mahia in Arabic. It's quiddity. It's whatness. Right? So, for example, if we use the analogy of a, Aristotle uses the analogy of a statue. Let's use the analogy of a statue. The efficient cause of a statue is the sculptor. The efficient cause, the force of production. Or you can say sculpting. What is the material cause of the statue? Well, marble, let's say, as opposed to wood. What would be the formal cause of the statue? What is it? What is it essentially? Well, it's the figure of a human being, for example. It's the apotheosis of George Washington, which is a statue in Washington, D.C. So what is the formal cause of the human being, according to our metaphysicians? It is, it is the Khalifa, the Viceroy, the representative of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the earth. Now, modern philosophers tend to be nominalistic. You see that term up there? Nominalism. In other words, they deny universals. They deny essential natures. They deny human nature. So there's no fitrah to tap into according to them. There's no innate disposition. Uh, there is no a priori knowledge. In other words, there's no knowledge without experience. And experience, according to them, is solely through the senses. This is also called empiricism, that nothing else informs the intellect other than the senses, and you have experience, and you have memory. So there's nothing innate within us, right? So like John Locke, he called it, he called our minds a tabula rasa, a clean slate, nothing innate, right? And this is in, in contrast to someone like Plato, who's a realist, who said that we're actually born with all of the knowledge of the forms or the essences of things within us, and we have to use dialectic to draw those meanings out. And those meanings are true, they're real. We'll talk more about this idea of dialectic, inshallah. But the position of the nominalist is that there is no axiomatic, no self-evident, no irresistible truths to recognize. So one of the names of the Quran is ad dhikr It is a reminder what does that imply? When we are reminded of truths in the, in the Quran, we find them irresistible and we embrace them because they tap into our fitrah, 
our human nature. They are irresistible. Unless the fitra has been damaged, and there's a difference of opinion about this, but some of the ulama say that our human nature can actually be changed and damaged through socialization. Right? So, ta'murun bil ma'ruf, they call to that which is ma'ruf. And ma'ruf literally means that which is known. Right? It's a, it's a passive participle. Arafa, ya'rifu, means to re, re, recognize, recognition. You recognize something you already do. The Quran is a dhikr, right? These are axiomatic, self evident truths. Like Thomas Jefferson, he says, in the preamble to the Declaration of Independence, he says that uh, we hold these truths to be self evident that all men are created equal and they are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights, namely life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So, according to, uh, to Thomas Jefferson, uh, uh, when the human intellect comes into contact with these ideas, equality of humanity, life, liberty, like freedom, the pursuit of happiness, they are irresistible. As long as a person's fitrah has not been damaged, they will immediately gravitate and embrace these ideas. Okay. However, nominalists, they reject human nature. right, And this leads to a denial then of objective morality. So everything then is subjective. Everything becomes a social construct. Right? Morality. They say, then what else did we get wrong? Right? So the very foundations, that which is axiomatic, have been shaken. Everything is questioned. So this has further led to a neutering or distrust of human intellect itself. A neutering of human reason. So then reason cannot be trusted. <laughs> So then finally, the logical conclusion is a philosophy known as voluntarism. A philosophy which gives primacy to the will over the intellect. Or as Nietzsche said, the will to power. Right? The will, from our perspective, should never exceed the jurisdiction of the intellect. The purpose of the intellect, the akal, is to keep the will, the desire, in check. Even the word akal in Arabic. One, the, the etymological meaning is to, is to limit or hobble something. Remember the, the, the famous hadith of the, the Bedouin who came into the masjid, his camel was outside running around the Prophet he said, whose camel is this? And the Bedouin said, that's my camel, atawakkalu ala Allah. I've trusted Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, i'qilha wa fatawakkal ala Allah. Hobble her first. Tie her down. I'qil. Right? The word aqil is related to this. The aqal is supposed to keep our will in check. But if you don't trust the intellect, then the will runs crazy. Like a camel that bolts away from you. So, I mean, Stoic philosophers would also say uh, that the purpose of the intellect is to keep the emotions in check as well. It's people who are highly emotive tend to be less rational. So then the principle becomes, do what you want, not what is right, because we can't know what is right. We can't trust the intellect. So the worship of the nafs, this is inevitable, worship of the hawa, of desires, of appetites, of the will. You see, you see the Quran wants us to think about things. There's a type of sentence in the Quran called the jumla istifhamiya, right? An interrogative sentence, which is a type of Jumla in Sharia, affective sentence according to the nomenclature of, of English grammar. This is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask us a question. Because we're supposed to think about the answer. Do they not look at the camels, how they're created? In another ayah. Where are you going? Look at your life. Where do you think you're going? Stop and do a self audit. Have you seen the one who takes as his God his will, his desire, his passion, his caprice? Right? This is the most common type of idolatry. Worship of the self. Egolatry. Selfism. We'll talk more about this inshallah. The intellect is neutered. The will takes primacy. So, this happens when you deny a formal cause. There's no essential nature. We affirm a formal cause, the quiddity, the mahya. What is it? And then there's the final cause. 
العلة الغائية Why is it? Why is it? It's purpose. It's telos. Right? So if we go back to the analogy of the statue, what is the final cause of that statue? It is to adorn a museum. The Smithsonian, in this case, if we're talking again about the apophasis of George Washington. So the purpose of the creation of the insan, in other words, our final cause, is given in the Quran itself. At Dhariyat, Surah 51, Ayah 56, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنْسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this in the first person singular, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ which is very rare in the Quran for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to speak in the first person singular, usually he speaks in the plural, and then he gives an affirmation after a negation. If that, بَعْدَ النَّفْيَن Very strong statement rhetorically in Arabic. I did not create the jinn and ins except to worship me. And of course, we're of course, uh, uh, familiar with the uh, opinion of Ibn Abbas. This is mentioned by Imam al baghawi in his tafsir. Ibn Abbas, he said that illa li ya'budun is understood as illa li ya'rifun. That in order to worship me is understood as in order to know me, have intimate knowledge of me, because he argues that true worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is predicated, or excellent worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is predicated upon deep, intimate knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you had intimate knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you would necessarily love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Well, how do we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? As we said, by associating, appropriating, and finally actualizing the divine names and attributes to truly be representatives, uh, khulafa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon the earth, to have i'ti psalm, a firm grip of the kitab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to have ittiba, which is adherence through imitation, adherence through mimesis, imitating the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, surah number 3, ayah number 31, ayah to intihan, wa in kuntum tuhibbun Allah, fattibi'uni. Say, if you really love Allah, then follow me. Yuhibbikum Allah. Then Allah will love you. So, the final cause, according to our tradition, is wilaya, to love God and to be loved by God. This is the final cause of the creation of the human being. The final cause of the creation of the human being, as it relates to this existence, to this earth. Okay, all of that was introduction. I'm going to take a, a breath. And a drink. Okay, so this is our metaphysics. It recognizes human nature. Human nature is unique. It's dignified. And it is goal or end oriented. By contrast, the dominant epistemology today in Western Academy, specifically American colleges and universities, is known broadly as postmodernism. Postmodernism includes various philosophical movements such as critical theory, everything is challenged, especially religious tradition. Deconstructionism, which is the literary method of postmodernism, we'll talk about what that is. Post-structuralism, which seeks to end hierarchical structures, we'll talk about that. And of, co of course, neo-Marxism, a political ideology. This is really our challenge, postmodernism. We need to understand what it is, how to deal with it, uh, or else this pandemic of ridda, of apostasy, will continue and continue. In contrast to pre-modernism and modernism, post-modernism is a revolt against faith and reason, against religion and rationality. First of all, a quick book recommendation, a book that I greatly benefited from is this book here, it's called Explaining Postmodernism. You can take a look at it after. Explaining Postmodernism, Skepticism and Socialism from Rousseau de Foucault by Stephen Hicks, who's at Rockford University in Illinois. It's a brilliant book that not only deals with uh, the philosophy of postmodernism, but its historical development and political underpinnings as well. Uh, I've been through 10 years of graduate school in the Bay Area. I'm a professor in a very academically rich environment in Berkeley. 
So I interact with undergrad and grad students <coughs> all the time. So I have a bit of experience with uh, the academic culture, really the monoculture, if you will, of modern universities, and its detrimental effects upon religiously confessional students, whether they're Muslim, Christian, or Jewish. This is an Abrahamic crisis. It is an Abrahamic crisis. Postmodernism is everywhere in the academy, really since the 1990s. Uh, if you've ever attended a public university, um, it doesn't matter if you were an English major or a history major or a chemistry major or a math major, you have been subtly indoctrinated by professors espousing postmodernist theories and ideas. There is really no way around it. It is an all-pervasive monoculture. These ideas, in my opinion, um, are nothing short of satanic, albeit implicitly satanic, and thus absolutely poisonous to religious traditionalists in the academy. This is what the shaitan does. Uh, so we need to understand the modus operandi, the MO of the shaitan. He calls to infidelity. It's quoted in the Quran. And shaitan says to the human being, disbelieve. So apostasy, ridda, which is spreading in academia like butter on toast, is usually commensurate with a, with a satanic presence. Apostasy and Satanism go hand in hand. Uh, and when you hear about Satan, you know, don't be dismissive, don't roll your eyes in disdain and ridicule. About a minute ago when I first men mentioned satanic, I actually noticed in this room people kind of smiling and rolling their eyes. This is a gravely important matter if we're believers. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, he refers to the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, as Uswatun Hasana one time in the Quran. A beautiful example. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions Al-Islam, the name of our deen, eight times in the Quran. Yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to the shaitan as Adu Mubin at least 15 times in the Quran. A clear, open, unambiguous enemy. Just look at a concordance. We need to take Satan seriously. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not mince his words. He is direct. He is straightforward. There is a reason for this repetition. There's an old saying from a popular movie. It says, uh, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world that he didn't exist. Even a lot of Muslims, you know, if you say, for example, you know, don't go out at night, you know, the demonic presence is very active, or if you say protect yourself with wudu, with azkar, with awrad, they say, really, in this day and age? One of my favorite sayings uh, is actually from Paul in the New Testament, go figure, Ephesians, very interesting. He says, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but rather with principalities of darkness in the world and against spiritual wickedness in high places, end quote. I agree, ours is a spiritual battle against dark forces. So we need to be spiritually powerful and intellectually formidable. Now, explicit Satanism, in theory and practice, is very much alive in the world today, whether in the form of Crowleyan black magic, which is called Goisha, which is literally conjuring of demons, also known as Thelema. Thelema in Greek means will, W-I-L-L, -L, right? Because their credo is do what you will. Again, uh, intimating the, the primacy of the will over the intellect. You also have something called Levian Satanism, also known as selfism or egolatry. I referred to that earlier, also known as the Church of Satan, which is essentially taking your hawasha, referred to as being Dionysian, right? In contrast to being Apollonian. Being Apollonian after Apollo means to give reason primacy. Reason is your guide. But to be Dionysian means to let your desires be your guide after the Greek god Dionysus, 
the son of Zeus, who was born from his father's thigh near his crotch. Thus, he's the wine. He's the god of wine, entertainment, pleasure, frivolity, self-indulgence. Right. So, freedom from religious law and absolute self-determinism are the dual principles of Satanists. Freedom from religious law and absolute self-determinism. This idea, I don't need God, and I can do whatever I want. Or as Elsa sang in the popular Disney movie, Frozen, no right, no wrong, no rules for me. I'm free. So if Satan is our enemy, and we wish to do battle against him, then we need to know our enemy, his ways, his mentality, his philosophy, his tools, his minions. How can you make spiritual warfare against an enemy? If you're ignorant of that enemy, know your enemy. <clears throat> there was a wise man, Kung Fu Tzu, also known as Confucius, the greatest of the Axial Age sages of the, of the Iron Age. He said, and I love this quote from him, tradition civilizes us, education perfects us. There's incredible profundity in that statement. In other words, we must look to our past, our golden age, and determine which principles and virtues led to such human flourishing to capture the zeitgeist of that age. And this is not to, you know, foolishly romanticize the past. That's not the goal here. There are certainly aspects of pre-modernism that we want to avoid. No, we're talking about virtues that led to intellectual and moral flourishing. We're not talking about cultural or political aspects. We need to identify those virtues, and then every single device of education should be utilized to inculcate those virtues within our, within our children in the present age. So our pedagogical methods must rely on tried and tested Tradition. The word pedagogy in Greek comes from pais, meaning child, and ago, which means to lead, to lead a child, right? We say tarbiya in Arabic. Rabba, yurabbi, means to guide someone in stages, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is rabbul alameen. He's the one that takes care of us in stages. Your parents are a type of arba, a type of, uh, of lords, lowercase l. Kama rabbayani sahira, right? That's what we say. The dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught us in the Quran, have mercy on me, have mercy on them. As they raised me up in childhood. So tarbiyah is very important. This is why hadith of Rahma, which I have here on the slide in English, the hadith of compassion from Muslim Ahmad is the first hadith that Muslim children learn according to traditional Islamic curriculum. Rahmah is the greatest virtue. Underlying the word compassion. The most compassionate shows compassion to those who show compassion. Show compassion to those on earth, and the one in heaven will show you compassion. Compassion, 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 compassion. This was chosen by our ulama because they want to drill into the mind of the child that compassion is indeed the greatest uh, virtue. So the ulama, they looked back at the Prophet sallallahu was a paragon of virtue, who said, Ana Nabi al-Rahma, I am the Prophet of mercy. Ana Rahmatun Muhda, I am a gifted mercy. They looked back at the Quran, Wama arsalnaki illa rahmati lil alameen, fabima rahmatin min Allah lin talahu, these ayat. However, in contrast to this Confucian deliberate tradition, as it is called, deliberate tradition, uh, traditional value systems in general are perceived as the enemies of humanity by postmodernists. Traditional value systems are inherently oppressive, they claim, because they are hierarchical and patriarchal. So we have to get into these terms, these are the buzzwords, right? You have to understand the nomenclature of the postmodernists. They love these two words, especially the latter one. 
I imagine postmodernists rewording that profound Confucian aphorism to say, tradition oppresses us, and education should politicize us. Because postmodernism and politics are inextricable, cannot be separated. I'll come back to this idea. Okay. This postmodern revolt against tradition, uh, tradition has now actually infected our popular films. So hypocritical Hollywood, you know, sometimes called Hollywood, hella weird, <laughs> with its putrid and shameless culture of transactional sex, prostitution, self-aggrandizement, holds in its hand one of the most powerful tools by which to indoctrinate masses of human beings. I mean, if you just think about the popularity of the Star Wars franchise. Tens of millions of people over, uh, over the last 40 years are obsessed with Star Wars. But ever since Disney has taken over in 2012, Star Wars has noticeably changed its tone. For example, in The Last Jedi, Kylo Ren says to Rey, both millennials, we would call them, quote, let the past die, kill it if you have to, end quote. That is quintessentially postmodernism. Now, when I say that postmodernism is poisonous to religious traditionalism in colleges and universities, again, I'm referring to Judeo-Christian Islamic tradition, the Abrahamic faith tradition. Okay. Abraham is pronounced Avraham in Hebrew. It literally means father of many nations, right? Ab, alif, ba, ab, abu means father. The word for father in Greek and Latin is pater. Abraham is the patriarch of our religion. Millata abikum Ibrahim, right? It is the tradition of the your patriarch, your father, Abraham. Isa alayhi salam is quoted to have said in the New Testament in Greek, a techna to Abraham ate, ta erga to Abraham apoyete an. He says to the Pharisees, if you were truly Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. So when you hear postmodernist professors of the social sciences rage against the oppression, tyranny, and eventual overthrow of the patriarchy, the rule of the Father. Now you know who they're talking about. It's Abraham, Ibrahim alayhi salam, who was called the friend of God in the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, in the New Testament, and in the Quran. Alistair Crowley, who's the famous Satanist, he said, and he said this in the early 20th century, he said, we are moving away from the age of the patriarch and into the age of Horus, as he called it. The age of the child, Horus is the son of Osiris and Isis. The age of rebellion, irresponsibility, and hedonistic self-indulgence. An age of antaridan amatur bataha, when the girl will give birth to her master. The age of extended adolescence. The age of the phenomenon of the 40-year-old man-child or woman-child what's known technically as paraphilic infantilism. Check this out. There's actually an entire subculture of adults who choose to live as children. This is also called age play. The most famous example, a 52-year-old man recently in Canada with seven kids decided to leave his wife and children to live as a six-year-old girl. He has pigtails, he wears dresses, right? Uh, <laughs> this is what's happening. You also have an entire subculture of adults living as dogs. It's called pup play. And what a surprise, the vast majority are homosexual men, smelling each other's behinds. I try not to use the word gay. I don't allow people to pressure me into using politically correct language, unless I want to. Uh, gay has a good meaning. I will not equate it with sexual perversion. The word gay is found in iconic Christmas songs. 
deck the halls. Gone, we now are gay apparel. When I was a kid, we watched reruns of the Flintstones. Right? We'll have a gay old time. Christmas and children have nothing to do with sodomy. I will not associate the two. So this is an age of shamelessness, of doing what thou wilt, which is, of course, again, the credo of Crowleyan Satanists. It's interesting, there's a hadith in the Arba'in of Imam Nawawi, the Prophet وسلم, says, I'm going to tell you something that every prophet told his people. If you have no shame, then do what thou wilt. Right? So it's not, okay, I don't have any shame, I'll do it. No. The point is, you have to have shame. You can't do what thou wilt. Now with that said, imagine an 18-year-old Quran and Sunya believing student entering into these institutions. Uh, institutions that have literally declared ideological warfare on Abrahamic morality. What do you expect will happen to his faith if he is not prepared for the intellectual battlefield? He will be ripped apart, chewed up, and spit out. Let's talk more specifically about postmodernism. Let's unpack the ideology a bit more. <clears throat> now, chances are you've come across names like Michel Foucault, Jacques Derrida, Jean Francois Lyotard, Stanley Fish, Richard Worthy, Frank Lentricchia, Andrea Dworkin. If their names are not familiar, their ideas will be, certainly. They are the major players. Point number one about postmodernism. Postmodernism rejects ultimate or absolute truth. There is no ultimate or absolute truth, they say. You have to find your own subjective truths, plural, with a lowercase t. Live your truth, as Oprah says. There is no uh, true self in God's image to be actualized by disciplining your desires. As I mentioned earlier, tachalluk and tahakuk, you must invent your true self. Self-invention. By engaging your desires. Um, I saw another movie about a month ago called Adventures. It was a commercial before the movie that caught my eye. It's a 30 second commercial. You have this young woman, millennial, she has a t-shirt with a rainbow on it, a homosexual advocate. And these are direct quotes. She says, look, here's the thing about Diet Coke. It's delicious. It makes me feel good. Life is short. Just do you. They love that. Just do you. Whatever it is. Diet Coke. Because I can. Beautiful. <laughs> Again, quintessential postmodernism. Right before the movie. Well, I couldn't even enjoy the movie. <laughs> Just do me? Okay, what if I like to torture animals? Just do me? Postmodernist philosophy here is actually self contradictory. To say that there is no absolute truth is to make a statement that is absolutely true. In other words, they're saying the only absolute truth is that there is no absolute truth. Most modernists tend to be radically skeptical about everything, right, except their own skepticism. However, contradictions don't seem to bother them because the intellect has been devalued. Point number two, postmodernism denies objective morality. As we said, you have this strain of nominalism where, where formal and final causes are rejected. Morality is totally fluid, they say, and relative. Now, the asas, the foundation of Abrahamic of the Abrahamic tradition, is love of God and love of your fellow human being, and that is absolutely fundamental. If you read the New Testament, if you read rabbinical writings, talk to a rabbi, talk to a pastor, uh, Imam Al Razi, he defined Islam. He said, "Al ibadatu lil khaliq wa rahmatu lil khalq." He said, Islam is the worship of the Creator and showing compassion towards the creation. However, as Abrahamic believers, this is a very important point. We don't conflate acceptance with love necessarily. 
we don't conflate acceptance with love. In other words, we can love people and simultaneously consider some of their behavior as morally reprehensible. <laughs> Postmodernists tend to conflate love with acceptance, so this idea that if you really love your transgender cousin, you would accept him totally for who he or she or she is. Z-E, an actual pronoun, one of the many pronouns that uh, people in the academy have fabricated that are now, at least in Canada, have proposed laws to compel people to use. Now this leads to another contradiction in postmodernist philosophy. <coughs> Postmodernists are highly intolerant of intolerance. It is as if they say, respect everyone, you idiot. <laughs> I remember, um, so, you know, just do you, that whole, that, that's called virtue signaling, right? That sounds like the right thing to say, but they don't actually practice it. What they mean is, just do you, as long as you agree with me, and if you don't, then you're a bigot. You need to change your beliefs. <laughs> uh, I was a tutor at the GTU for a while, tutoring uh, a sister, a Christian sister in Hebrew, um, kind of strange, Muslim, uh, <laughs> Muslim guy tutoring a Christian student in Hebrew. Anyway, she saw me a few months after our tutoring sessions from a distance, and she said, "Adi, Adi," and she wanted to give me a hug. Uh, and I said, "No, I, I don't. I don't hug." She said, "What?" I, don't, I said, "I don't hug women." Uh, and I had to explain it to her. She said, "Really?" She put out her hand and wanted to shake my hand. So um, you know, I don't. I don't. <laughs> so. She said, I'm so offended. She was serious. I'm so offended. You won't shake my hand because I'm a woman? So I, I turned the tables on her. Right? Uh, I played the victim. Right? And I told her I was doing this. I said, what? You're offended? I'm an oppressed minority in America. I have brown skin. I'm a Muslim. And my religious beliefs offend you? I'm offended you're offended. <laughs> she said, oh my God. <laughs> You're so hard. So, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but this is why traditional or religiously confessional students, what we need, are so reluctant, that is to say, afraid, to take a theological or moral stance in a university classroom. To say, for example, that pantheism or incarnationalism is incorrect theology. Or to say that homosexuality is sexually perverse is to invite upon oneself a hailstorm of ad hominem epithets, such as arrogant, ignorant, antiquated, dogmatic, homophobic, transphobic, bigoted, traditionalists. Those modernists are dogmatically opposed to dogma. Point number three. Those modernist literature is often convoluted, uh, incoherent, and condescending. It is form way over substance. Its pseudo-profundity is often perceived by young believers in college as just too deep and insightful for me to understand. They think to themselves, no, I must be an idiot. I just don't get it. Right? It's kind of like modern art. I don't know if you've ever been to a museum of modern art. <laughs> Uh, my daughter took a class, she was, we took a college class, and so we went to the field trip to the MoMA in San Francisco, the Museum of Modern Art. We were there for about 15 minutes. We scratched our heads and left. <laughs> so there's this, well, not, there's this portrait, it was completely blank, and it's called the mirror. And there's this crowd of people looking at it, going, oh, wow. <laughs> What is this? It's so profound. And I kind of look at my daughter like, are we looking at the same thing? There was this pile of sticks in the corner. A pile of sticks. And people were looking at it. Amazing sculpture. Amazing work. There was another one, Wallahi. I felt like my four year old could have done a better job. It was crayon scribbles. Wallahi. It was crayon scribbles. And people were looking at it. Wow. <laughs> people were like having these 
<laughs> cathartic experiences. We assume it must be deep and profound because it's in a museum, but it's the emperor's new clothes. There's nothing there. This is how their literature is. Postmodernist literature, it sounds deep and profound. It is nonsense. Nonsense. They actually give an award, an annual reward, to who can write the most incoherent text. And this professor, you see Berkeley, this Baptist professor, she keeps winning the award. It's just this kind of speak they have amongst each other. They purposely write incoherently to impress each other. It's nonsense. Anyway, these believers, they, because of this, they feel a sense of, a strong sense of inadequacy and embarrassment for both their inability to grasp the convoluted literature and for their, quote, simple belief in God, morality, right and wrong, and after. They're actually scared to say, I believe in this, I think this is right, I think that's wrong. They're ridiculed, right? For many of these young believers, there are only two viable options. I call it selling out or checking out. In other words, attempt to change the very face of the religion in order to mitigate the hurt feelings of certain individuals who are offended by the morality in religious texts or to leave the religion altogether because they just don't want to deal with it. So the sellout says, yes, I'm Muslim, but I don't believe in this or that verse in the Quran or this or that hadith. The checkout says, Muslim? No, not anymore. I used to be, but now I'm enlightened. Uh, the most infamous of the postmodern philosophers was a Frenchman, one Michel Foucault, died in 1984, but continues to be an absolute rock star in universities all around the world. He famously said, quote, it is meaningless to speak in the name of or against reason, truth, or knowledge. It is meaningless to speak of or against reason, truth, or knowledge. And he was a product of the trend, what's known as a continental philosophy in the history of Western philosophy. If you studied it, this is philosophy from the mainland of Europe that was prevalent in the 19th and 20th. Uh, centuries, a philosophy that was becoming less and less confident in truth, reason, and objective reality, a philosophy that's represented by Immanuel Kant, right, the critique of pure reason, or Kierkegaard, we need to crucify reason. However, Kant and Kierkegaard both believed in God, they were Christians, but then you have the atheistic irrationalist Friedrich Nietzsche, who called the human intellect, quote, pitiful, and that emotion Drive, ambition, will, and desire should be our guides. Foucault is even more radical. By the way, Foucault was a drug-addicted homosexual Maoist who died of AIDS in 1984. He actually fell in love with the pre-AIDS San Francisco gay bar scene of the early 1980s. Uh, Foucault also had a profound effect on the Muslim majority world as well. He was a professor of psychology at the University of Tunis from 1966 to 1968. Right? Truth, reason, and knowledge. Aql, or mantik, haq, and ilm are meaningless, he says. Noam Chomsky, it's interesting. Uh, he actually says, uh, he, Noam Chomsky, you, you know Chomsky, the professor of linguistics at MIT. He says that postmodernism is even more, quote, protest in the Muslim world than in the Western world. Right? He says he gives, he goes to universities um, in the Middle East all the time, and he's always called naive because he speaks about truth and objective history. They say that's old fashioned. So reason is meaningless, they say. Now reason is limited, that's true, but is it meaningless? Can we really not know anything? So how many times do we find in the Quran phrases like Afala ta'ilun, la'alakum ta'ilun, in kuntum ta'ilun? We must place some confidence in the intellect, in reason. Now Muslim theologians like Ibn Taymiyyah, he said that aql and naql, reason and revelation, are not in conflict, but are the proper use 
of the formal former will lead to the recognition of the latter because they come from the same source. They're both from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam al-Ghazali says in his Bistas al mustaqim that the Quran itself appeals to logic through syllogistic arguments long before Hellenistic influences upon Muslim theological discourse. The prophets in the Quran use logic and reason to appeal to their respective communities because logic and reason have efficacy. For example, in the Quran, Badir Samawati wal Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is called Badir, which is the efficient cause, the origin, originator of the universe. There is nothing like him whatsoever. He transcends space, time, and materiality. Cause and effect do not apply to him. Or else you're stuck in infinite regress, which is repugnant to the intellect. That's just one example. So if you're a Muslim educator, professor, a chaplain, a teacher, from graduate school to Sunday school, it is your duty to say to these young people, Sadaq Allah. Allah speaks the truth. فَاتَّبِعُ مِلَّةِ إِبْرَاهِمَ حَنِيفًا Follow, have ittiba. What is ittiba? Adherence to imitation. Adhere to the tradition of Ibrahim salam, the archetypal monotheist. Edward Lane, he actually says that in his famous lexicon, that ittiba always has an element of imitation, mimesis. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says in the Quran, لا تتبع خطوات الشيطان Don't adhere to the footsteps of Satan. فَإِنَّهُ يَأْمُرُ بِالْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرِ Because he calls or he orders to perversity and falsehood. Perversity and falsehood. So these words are in the Quran. They have meanings. They are normative definitions. They are defined by the Quran and Sunnah. The Qur'an is theologically and morally judgmental. You cannot avoid it. Everybody is judgmental. Everybody. The Qur'an is theologically and morally judgmental. And we must be prepared with reason to defend those judgments without apology. Even if people have discounted reason, continue to be reasonable. It is our reason that makes us human. It is our differentia, as Aristotle said. We are the rational animal. Reason will win in the end. Emotional incontinence cannot be sustained. People get tired of emotion, but they will not tire of reason. So we must employ dialectic. Dialectic is the Socratic method. What is dialectic? Dialogue and debate based on asking and answering questions to stimulate critical thinking in order to tease out the truth, true knowledge, as opposed to rhetoric. Dialectic leads to knowledge, right? Rhetoric leads to opinion. What is rhetoric? Sophistry. Just trying to get your own opinion across. You don't care about truth. It's like a defense lawyer who knows his client is guilty. But he doesn't care. He's not trying to get to the truth. He's trying to get his client acquitted. He only cares about persuasion. So Aristotle said there are three modes of persuasion. It's very important. Three modes of persuasion, of effective communication. These are the Greek terms. They're pronounced logos, ethos, and pathos. Logos, or logos, is a reference to logic. You're using facts and figures. Right? Ethos is a reference to the speaker himself or herself, that they have a good disposition, um, that they have a good reputation. And then pathos is its emotional appeal. So the rhetorician, the sophist, primarily appeals to pathos. He wants to emotionally manipulate you. Whereas the dialectician, primarily appeals to logos and ethos because he wants to get to the truth. In the Quran, call to the way of your Lord. With wisdom, and the ulama say here, the meaning of this is with dalail, rational aqli and, and scriptural proof texts. 
right? With logos, with mawridat al-hasana, with a good disposition, with good ethos. وَجَادِلْهُمْ بِالَّتِيهِ أَحْسَنْ And debate with them in ways that are better than what they're doing. They're going to, they're sophists, they're rhetoricians. They're going to play the victim. You've offended me. They're going to use ad hominem attacks. Keep your cool and use facts and figures. Use logic. Use logos. Use uh, appeal to the intellect. So our young people need prophetic advice. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said, Speak the truth, even if it's bitter. There is truth. It's not relativism. He says, speak the truth, even if it's bitter. And don't be afraid of people. Morality is not subjective. Truth is real. Falsehood is real. We need to stand up for it. Stop being afraid. A man came to the Prophet and said, give me some advice. He said, Qul amantu billah thumastaqim. He said, say, uh, I believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and be theologically and morally steadfast upon that. And I, I always say this, if people think you're weird, that's fine. The Prophet said, fatuba lil ghuraba, glad tidings to the weirdos. We should be weird. In this day and age, if we're not if we're not weird, we're doing something wrong. We should be, we should stand up. And if people disagree with you, fine. You ever heard of that? You ever thought about that? You have your religion, I have my religion. You have your way of life, I have my way of life. You have your uh, Theological beliefs or lack thereof, you have your ideas of morality and nature and nurture and all of that, and so do I. Don't tell me what to say or do. I won't tell you what to say or do. This should really be our attitude, right? Because we're living in a Meccan phase. It was revealed in Mecca, from man sha'afa yu'min, wa man sha'afa yakfur. Whoever wants to believe, let him believe. Whoever wants to disbelieve, let him disbelieve. You will hear adhan kathira, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran. You will hear a lot of Annoying discourse that's going to grieve you, right? Uh, but if you are patient and you guard against evil, that's going to be the determining factor. That's what's going to come. Be patient and guard against evil. Don't be a sellout. Life is supposed to be a bit difficult. The dunya is supposed to be difficult. Dunya means the low adna, the low world. The lowest world, that's what happens here. The Prophet وسلم, he said that Surat Hud wa Akhawatuha turned my shayyabatni. He said that these, these group of surahs, they turned my hair gray because the tanzil was so strong upon him. And then he singled out one ayah in particular, ayah 112 of Surat Hud, Fastaqim uh, kama umirt. Be upright as you have been commanded. He found that difficult, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Physically, it's difficult. But we have to go through it. Life is short. Don't sell out. Right? Don't check out. Okay. Now, the literary method of, of postmodernists is called deconstructionism. According to deconstructionism, <coughs> no one interpretation of a text, such as a religious text, i.e. the Quran, should be privileged over other readings. They love this word privilege. Social sciences aside, even the hard sciences are feel like physics, biology, they're feeling the pressure of postmodernist thinkers. There's a French feminist philosopher. When I say feminist, I'm talking about third wave feminism. I'm not talking about first wave where there's equal rights. We have no problem there. Second wave is a revolt against gender roles, a little problematic. Third wave is about body autonomy and taking down the patriarchy and replacing it with a matriarchy. What does that mean? The right to abort babies and taking down men and ruling them. This is the essence of third wave feminism. There's a French third wave feminist philosopher named Ira Gary. She said, get this, you can't make this stuff up, folks. The equation E equals MC squared is sexist. 
going to let that marinate for a minute. <laughs> Why? Because it privileges the speed of light over other lights. <laughs> Apparently there are now an infinite number of genders. You know, aql and naql, reason and scripture. See, there are two genders, xy, xx, bakr, unsa. We are told by postmodernists, social scientists, we're told by Zuckerberg, we're told by <laughs> gender theorists at the university. Gender theory, interesting. We're told by gender theorists at the university that people who maintain this rigid binary are bigots. They're just not woke. <laughs> Get woke. Get a book, not get woke. Why Gender Matters, Dr. Leonard Sachs. Extraordinary text. Before it's banned, and I mean that, California Assembly Bill 2943 already proposed the banning of books that are offensive to the LBGTQIA community. California legislation is trying to ban books that seek to reform homosexuals and declare them hate speech. What is the natural progression? This makes Christians very nervous because homosexuality in the Bible is immoral. They say, well, you know, Good written is Christianity. No. Wrong attitude. They come for you tonight. They're coming for us in the morning. We're next. A great American Muslim scholar once said, Shaitan wants to change the immutables to mutable. Shaitan wants to change thawabit. What are thawabit? Thawabit are underlying principles, axiomatic, self-evident truths. He wants to change those into variables, mutagayarat, these things can change. It wants to lay to waste our underlying principles. There are classical laws of thought, such as the principle of identity, the principle of non-contradiction. So male is male, and not male is not male. There are 3,500 biological differences between men and women. The Quran says, the, human, the, the man, the male, is not like the female. There are gender roles rooted in biology. Rooted in biology. What I just said could get me expelled from a university classroom, by the way. There are gender roles rooted in biology. In khalq, our khalq. It is not purely a social construct or a feeling. There's an article in the Huffington Post. Some people call it the Huffington Compost. <laughs> where there's a picture of a man sitting on a park bench, you know, looks like a man, uh, with a blood stain in his crotch, holding a sign that says, men get periods too. <laughs> Turns out, that is a biological woman, dressed up like a man. So the headline should be, woman gets period. <laughs> wow. If you're a man, putting on your grandmother's shoes doesn't make you an old woman any more than barking like a dog makes you a dog. American slaves living in the antebellum South, the pre-Civil War South, had a suicide rate that high. People who were separated from their families, treated like animals, and utterly brutalized do not have a suicide rate the rate of some suburban transgender in 2018. Interesting. Clearly, gender identity syndrome, which is what it used to be called, now they call it gender dysphoria, gender identity syndrome is a mental illness in adults. But how, but now, it is politically incorrect to say that. It is politically incorrect to say that. Something that will help people, you cannot say. There is a confirmed mental illness, according to the APA, called Body Integrity Identity Disorder. Body Integrity Identity Disorder. This is when a person feels, to, uh, then feels the need to amputate his or her healthy body parts. But when a 12-year-old girl feels like she's a boy and wants to amputate her breasts 
She is called brave, courageous, and a hero. Be yourself. Do you. Just go get it. Get it. Amazing. There was a Google engineer, James Damore, I don't know if you've heard of him, uh, who was fired from Google because he wrote a memo suggesting that biological differences between men and women help explain the differences of their career choices. He's absolutely right. And he was fired because it's not PC to say that. In other words, the STEM field, science, technology, engineering, and math, contain more men than women because women are not nearly as interested in those fields as men are. There are also a lot more men in construction, sanitation, and plumbing because women are not interested in those jobs. From a theological standpoint, it is Satan who wants to blur the lines of gender. This is why Baphomet, which is the official symbol of the Church of Satan, is usually depicted as androgynous, clearly the body of a man with female breasts, because he shatters the gender binary. <coughs> Baphomet is woke, apparently. There's a good hashtag for you. Hashtag, <laughs> Baphomet is woke. Now, I'm going to come back to deconstructionism, but I want to talk more about homosexuality. This is a big, big issue in the academy. This is the social issue. Homosexual advocates are making this into a civil rights issue. Now as believers, when we engage, uh, um, as believers, we should, we should engage in dialectic. Because we should know that if we appeal to the Quran, it is then a logical fallacy. Someone who doesn't believe in the Quran is asking you, why don't you, why don't, why don't you accept homosexuality as a lifestyle? And if you say, well, it's in the Quran, that's called an argument from unqualified authority, because they don't believe in that authority. You have to give secular arguments. You have to use dialectic. Okay? There's this conservative uh, YouTuber, I don't agree with everything he says, obviously, but he has this interesting thing where he goes around interviewing people on the street. Usually they're millennials or in that age range. I hate to pick on them, but it's okay. My, my kids are almost at that age. They're not all the same, right? Okay. So he <laughs> goes up to someone and he says, how do you feel about a man marrying another man? How do you feel about a man marrying another man? And this person says, yeah, why not? Two consenting adults. What's wrong with that? To each his own. Whatever floats your boat. Right? He says, okay, two consenting adults. That's right, of course. Okay, well, how do you feel about a man marrying his daughter that are both consenting adults? And they say, no, no, I don't, I don't agree. And then he says, what? Are you an incest phobe? That's all you have to do. Throw out the ad hominem. Are you an incest phobe? Oh, no. Oh, I, guess, I guess it's, you know, as long as they don't have kids. <laughs> what? Are you denying my right to have children? <laughs> no, no, and you can see them one by one. Okay, nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong. As long as they're not hurting anyone. Right? The CDC. What is CDC? Center, Center, of, disease. Disease Center of Disease Control. According to them, homosexuals are 2% of the population, homosexual men. <coughs> yet account for 78% of HIV cases. 2% account for 78% of HIV cases. 83% of syphilis. There's a group, Americans for Truth About Homosexuality, AFTA, that you can do some research on. More than one out of 10 homosexual men is incontinent. If you don't know what that means, look it up. I've read from 12% to 25% of homosexual men are incontinent. The Kinsey Institute published a study by Bell and Weinberg from 1978 saying that finding that promiscuity among homosexual men is through the roof. Check this out. 28% of homosexual men have had sexual encounters with 1,000 or more partners. Multiple studies have shown that casual sex causes depression, anxiety, and mental illness. 
Now, 79% of that 28% said that more than half of their partners were complete strangers. So if you go to like those gay bars, movie, gay movie theaters, <laughs> gay dance clubs, they have these back rooms that actually cater to this type of thing. This is clearly a mental illness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intimates that homosexual, homosexual promiscuity is a mental illness in the Quran. La amruka. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says directly to the Prophet And this is the only time which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes an oath by the life of the Prophet So this is a big oath. La amruka innahum lafi sakratihim ya'mahun. By your life, they are indeed in their wild intoxication wandering blindly. Homosexuality is transforming the very fabric of society. It is destroying the traditional nuclear family. It spreads disease and a culture of irresponsibility. Several studies have shown that same-sex relationships do not last nearly as long as heterosexual relationships. So children end up suffering due to these highly dysfunctional relationships. Use the argument from nature, from natural selection. Put one million homosexual men on an island, give them the best technology, cutting edge health care, in 100 years, everyone is dead. Nature selects. Now a common argument, and this is coming from Muslim homosexual colleges, is that why would Allah create them like that? Right? Now, well, first of all, there's no scientific evidence whatsoever of a gay gene. So this whole idea of born this way, right, the Lady Gaga anthem, is a lie. One can certainly make the argument that homosexuality is the result of trauma suffered during the development of one's brain in early childhood. So something like divorce, rejection by a father or a mother, sexual molestation, being physically abused, Dr. Omar Johnson, who counsels African-American youth, he says, and he's a clinical psychologist for something like 20 years, to 95% of the black youth that come to him that identify as homosexual are victims of trauma in childhood. The other thing is, how would a gay gene even survive natural selection? Wouldn't nature weed it out eventually? It doesn't seem to be happening. It seems to be growing. Evolutionary biologist and um, uh, anti-theist polemicist Rich, Richard Dawkins over at Oxford University, evolutionary biologist, uh, he really doesn't have an answer. He doesn't know. He has some theories that I won't go into, but one of them he says is, well, maybe it's because maybe babies that feed from a bottle turn gay and <laughs> those who breastfeed are straight. This is, this is according to Richard Dawkins. This is their main man. Interesting. Well, going back to this question, why would Allah create them like that? Let's just entertain the premise for now. Okay, that's how they were created. This is similar to the transgender thing. What about a child born in the Congo into abject poverty to a single mother who is HIV positive because of a vaccine that she took, yet that child never complains? Welcome to the dunya. Life is hard. We are in no position to judge Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are children born blind with major mental and physical disabilities. This is qadr. There are men who are born with proclivities towards children. Do we ask why did Allah create them like that? No, we expect them not to act out on their perversion. Okay, switching gears here, go back to deconstructionism. According to deconstructionism, there are no right and wrong readings of any text. There are no true and false readings. The idea of a meta-narrative, meta-narrative is to say the standard interpretation of a text that shape religious orthodoxy. These are summarily rejected like postmodernists. All readings are valid and equally important, they say. What is demanded, according to what is only demanded, according to another infamous postmodernist, 
American professor named Stanley Fish, is to be, quote, interesting. Just be interesting. Not to be right or correct, because right, correct, normative, orthodox, these do not exist, according to them. Just be interesting. As long as it's entertaining, as long as it feels great. So now we have in religious departments and seminaries a method of interpretation known as radical hermeneutics. Radical hermeneutics of sacred texts, like queer hermeneutics. For example, you have Muslims in the seminary justifying homosexuality based on the Quran. I don't know how on earth one would even do that, but they managed to do it somehow. They say things like, no, the Quran is not forbidding homosexual acts. It's only saying not to rape each other, which is interesting because in the Quranic narrative, uh, Lut alayhi salam, he says to the men that are coming to uh, seduce the other men, he says to them, take my daughters instead. They say the meaning of that is marry the women of my ummah instead of having uh, relations with the men. That's the meaning of that. If the Quran is only denouncing their rape, then what is Lut actually saying? Rape my women? Rape my daughters instead of the men? No, that's not what he's saying. But this is, as long as it's interesting, don't worry about contradictions. You can put it out there and get your master's degree and get a professorship and you can travel around the country and you can engage in this nonsensical academic speak but nobody understands except a few of your colleagues and you can get back, go back to the back room and drink and laugh about it later. Queer hermeneutics, transgender hermeneutics, third wave feminist hermeneutics, neo-Marxist hermeneutics, it is a... <clears throat> so the quest for truth or the intended authorial meanings of a text are abandoned, rather sacrificed upon the altar of self-interest and feelings. So things like grammar, logic, rhetoric, syntax, definitions, consistency, context, who cares? Scripture now bends to accommodate us, not us to accommodate it. Rather than interrogating our own positions in light of Scripture, we interrogate Scripture in light of our own positions. In short, Scripture can now mean whatever we want it to mean. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, there will come a time upon the people, la yabqa, la yabqa minan islam illa ismahu, that nothing will remain of Islam except its name. It's just a nomen, a name without a reality. No essence, no normative definition. Totally subjective. <coughs> this hadith indicates that there is indeed an orthodox normative definition of Islam. It's not defined by our feelings, it's defined by Allah and His Messenger. Nothing will remain of the Quran except its script. It's just words on a page deprived of their true meaning. A couple of hadith of our Master Muhammad at the end of the time, there are going to be flagrant, habitual liars, impostors, who will make statements that neither you nor your ancestors or forefathers have ever heard. In other words, according to the Urnama, they will say things that are absolutely irreconcilable with our faith tradition that no Muslim has ever heard, yet they will justify themselves religiously. This is already rampant in biblical studies. I have an MA in biblical studies. My former academic advisor, who is now the director of New Testament studies at the College of the Holy Cross, a Jesuit school on the East Coast, this man said, and there's a huge uproar about it, he said, I'm not going to say, but one of the greatest prophets, he said, was, quote, a gay, gender-fluid drag king. This is postmodern, radical hermeneutics at its worst. La yudillunakum, beware of them, wa la yuftinunakum, lest they misguide you or involve you in their fitna. <laughs> what is the role of the ulama during this troublesome time? Hadith al Bayhaqi, yahmilu hadha al-im min kulli khalfin uduluh, yanfuna anhu tahrif al-ghalim, 
وانتحال المبتلين وتأويل الجاهلين أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام This sacred knowledge will be born by reliable authorities of each successive generation. They will remove from it the alterations of those guilty of exaggeration, the plagiarism of the corrupt, and the interpretations of the ignorant. We're coming down to the end, folks. And we'll open it up for some comments and questions. A little dialectic, inshallah. <laughs> We have until four o'clock, so this is my tenth slide. I only have eleven. Another pillar of postmodernism is named Frank Lentricchia. Uh, <clears throat> uh, he said that the very purpose of a college education is to exercise power for the purpose of social change, not to pursue virtue or truth. Why? Because truth is meaningless, and virtues are relative. Everything is power plays. Life is all about power, they say. Human beings act, uh, human beings don't act out of piety or morality. They just want power. In other words, <laughs> according to postmodernists, the only worthwhile purpose of a college education is to create political activists. So postmodernism clearly has Marxist underpinnings, which are further highlighted by its relentless demand for radical egalitarianism in order to create some sort of communist, godless, raceless, genderless, classless utopia on earth where technology reigns supreme. Now, we have to pursue justice, no doubt about it. But... Uh, Infinite justice, spoiler alert, will never be recognized, will never be achieved, will never be actualized in the dunya. Never. That's the whole point of Yom al Qiyam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al Adil. He is the absolutely just. It's only on that day will it will manifest. This doesn't mean that we should have worked towards justice on the earth. Of course we do. Imam al qurtubi said the basis of our sharia is adala, is justice, of course. But this unnatural obsession for earthly justice, to the point where I go to an MSA at a university, and the students aren't praying, they'd rather go protest than pray. <laughs> What's going on? Very strange. And when I tell them we should pray, it takes priority, they look at me like I'm some sort of mullah. <laughs> what is this mullah talking about? <laughs> he's out of touch. He's, he's an old man. <laughs> Not as old as others. <laughs> so, they espouse the misguided proposition that inequality is always due to inequity. In other words, if another social group is doing better than your group, then you must be victims of their oppression. This is this type of explanatory monism. There are no other factors, they say. It's always oppression. Why are these ideas detrimental to believers? Because they completely eliminate gratitude, shukur. They, 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 they foster this idea that everyone's out to get me and I'm a perpetual victim. There's no time to be grateful. Shukur and kufur are just juxtaposed in the Quran, they're antonyms, they're opposites. Fadkuruni as kurkum, washkuruni wala takfurun. Remember me or have regard for me so that I might have regard for you. Be grateful to me and don't disbelieve. In other words, to be ungrateful is to disbelieve. In other words, the word kafir in Arabic means ingrate. Mm -hmm. They eliminate, this philosophy eliminates shukur, it eliminates humility. Tawadur, this idea of if I'm not progressing in the dunya, maybe I'm doing something wrong. What have I done? Elimin no, you're a victim. They're out to get you. It eliminates introspection, muhasaba, the self-audit. Sit down for five minutes and think about what am I doing? Where am I going? What have I done? It eliminates personal responsibility. The Prophet said, Kullukum ra'in wa kullukum mas'oolun an ra'iyyati. 
Oh, come on, Allah, All of you are a shepherd, and all of you will be questioned. All of you are responsible for your flock. Who, who are your flock? Your, your intellect, your faculties, your limbs, your children, your spouses, your parents. will be questioned. Personal responsibility. These ideas coming out of the university, they promote self-victimization. And to, and to play the victim, according to Roger Scruton, is an assault on rationality in the public discourse. It is a cop-out. It is lazy. We must take ownership for ourselves. We must stop blaming other people for our problems. The Prophet ﷺ did not victimize himself. One of my teachers mentioned the, the Satan versus Adam paradigm, the Satanic versus Adamic paradigm. That that uh, Shaitan, when Allah Subhanahu wa Taala expelled him from the garden, he said, "Fabima aghwaytani." Because you caused me to err, you did this. I will lie in wait for them. Your servants will <clears throat> come at them from all directions. Shifts responsibility. Victimizes himself. You did this. It's like this. Why would why would Allah create people like that? Why did Allah do that? Allah Allah yaf'alu ma Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can do whatever he wants. Who who the heck are you? To question Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nothing. You don't need to exist. If you died tomorrow, your neighbor will be eating his Cheerios. And you'll think for a second, oh, that guy died. Can you pass the milk? <laughs> You're not that important. Really. Sorry to be so <laughs> expressive. <laughs> but Adam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a doer of everything. That's, that's the theological point. He does everything. But look at the attitude. Because you did this to me. That's, that's shaitan. What, what uh, Adam, alayhi salam? Rabbana and Eve. Rabbana is in the plural. This is a, this is a first person common plural. So uh, Eve, alayhi salam, is also making this dua. Rabbana, Rabbana, thalamna antusana, wa illam tawfir lana, wa tarhamna, lanakunan min al-khasimin. Oh, our Lord, we wrong ourselves. And if you don't have mercy on us, we'll be lost. Mm -hmm. See the difference? Mm -hmm. One self-victimizes. Uh, one uh, makes tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The most dangerous thing about this philosophy coming out of these universities, it cuts off tawbah. Because if there's no objective morality, you can't break any moral laws. There's no need for tawbah. It's like, uh, well, even though he's a Christian, uh, President Trump, who was asked, have you ever asked God for forgiveness? I don't feel the need to. <laughs> I don't think I've ever been wrong. Okay. Christians. These postmodernist ideas cause major conflicts between human beings, pinning them against each other in a never-ending grab for power. Black man against white man. Male against female, rich against poor. The paraphrase fairies, uh, Professor Jordan Peterson, I tend to agree with him on this point. If you're sitting in a university classroom and you hear things like white privilege, toxic masculinity, oppressive patriarchy, cultural appropriation, mansplaining, intersectionality, you should know that you are being ideologically and politically groomed. That is more properly indoctrination than education. Don't play the dirty game of identity politics. We need to interrogate ideas irrespective of the identity of the person who is espousing those ideas. In other words, treat people as individuals, not as part of groups. That doesn't work anymore. i give you a story. I, I was in a I gave a lecture one time, and I said something about Christianity in the lecture. And a brother from the audience, after the lecture, he is a convert, he came up to me and he said, you should never talk about Christianity. He doesn't know anything about my background. Uh, I said, why not? He said, because you were never Christian. I said, but I have a, an MA in New Testament, I have a PhD in comparative religion. He said, it doesn't matter. You are not allowed to talk about Christianity. Is you were never a Christian. I said, oh, that's... Well, what did I say? Did I say something wrong? No, what you said was correct. <laughs> okay? 
<coughs> Look, if a straight white Christian man criticizes Islam or Muslims, that does not make him a racist. It is a non-sequitur argument. Don't play the dirty game. I actually agree with Sam Harris on this one. You remember what happened on Bill Barr's show with Batman? Uh, Batfleck? Ben Affleck. So Sam Harris was criticizing Islam, and he said, that's racist. It's not racist. Islam is a set of ideas. It's not a race. People can criticize it. Don't be so quick to jump the gun and call people racist. That's a cop-out. That doesn't work. That's a weakness. And if you say that a white man is not allowed to speak about Islam, that ironically is racism. <laughs> Look at his statement. If it's wrong, rip it apart. Don't rip him apart. Don't go after the man. Don't be ad hominem. Look at the argument. Sometimes ad hominem is uh, effective in rhetoric, but it has to be tempered. Now, now we have postmodernists talking about the elimination of hierarchical structures, even within the family unit. This is what they learn in social sciences classes. <clears throat> because, according to them, Gender roles are an oppressive social construct and just another manifestation of the evil patriarchy. And if Judith Butler at UC Berkeley says it, then it must be true. She's the one that always wins the award for the most incoherent book ever written. <laughs> Every year she wins it. And check this out. Postmodernist professor Andrea Dworkin compared a married woman to being a man's, quote, chattel. She said, quote, a, mare, a normal man operates in the mode of predation, end quote. In other words, a normal man, a normal man is a predator. This is what college students are reading. So a further assault upon traditional marriage and a reinforcement of the man versus woman paradigm. You see, our religion does not pit men against women in some radically antagonistic battle of the sexes. They're not in competition. They excel in different areas and complement each other. You ever heard the hadith, half my deen? Right? You're not a complete person unless you're married. Based on their khalq, based on their biology, their hard wirings, where it suits them, postmodernists pretend like biology doesn't exist and everything's a social construct. There is some social construction but it is limited. It is certainly not everything. In our tradition, men and women are equal spiritually, but not the same biologically. You ready for the... And I forgot to give the disclaimer. My views do not necessarily represent those of NCC. I'm going to drop the bomb on you. Ready? There are not equal rights in the Sharia. There are not equal rights in the Sharia, but equitable rights. And, and for her are rights equitable, and for her and for her are rights similar to what is against her, equitable, according to what is known, self-evident. For example, a woman must cover her head. Do I have to cover my head? Do I have to? We have unequal rights. It's, by definition, unequal. A man can marry four women. Can a woman marry four men? A man must support his wife financially. Can he elect not to and have his wife support him financially? A woman is excused from prayer during her menses. You see, we live in reality. We live in reality. These gender theorists and social justice activists SJW, social justice warriors, they live in La La Land. They live, and I don't, don't mean Los Angeles. <laughs> Some of them do, though. Some of them even say that men and women are exactly the same, even physically. I'd like to see where this goes. Because right? I want LeBron James to wake up tomorrow morning. I want him to say, you know what? Gender is a social construct. I feel like a woman. I'm going to join the WNBA. <laughs> Good luck. We'll, 
Chamberlain's record is going down. <laughs> <laughs> there is an MAM, a mixed martial arts fighter in Fallon Fox, biologically male, but identifies as a woman, and is sending women to the hospital, beating women up. This, this is a man. He has the, the, the frame of a man. Men have bone density that's thicker, huge head, incredible muscles. And sending these women to the hot, they can't say anything. If you say, oh, this is a man, oh, you're a transphobe, you're a bigot, so on and so forth. Remember this guy, John McEnroe? He was a, he actually heard him on TV today, it's a US Open, the commentator. He got into some hot water because he was on a radio show and he said, you know, I think being uh, Serena Williams is the greatest female tennis player of all time. That's what he said. That comment got him in hot water. Isn't that a compliment? Yeah. The host said, what do you, what do you mean by that? It's like, what? <laughs> he did a little bit What? <laughs> what? Why didn't you say she's the greatest, period? And he said, because... She's a female. She's not. <laughs> and then Venus, uh, Serena Williams was asked later, if you played with the men, how would you fare? She said, I, I wouldn't even be in the top 100. That's it. That's... But people want to equalize. I mean, if you mean that she's the greatest pound for pound, you know how they say, like, um, what's the guy, uh, Mayweather? Mayweather is the greatest boxer pound for pound. Meaning all things being equal, he's better than, let's say, Mike Tyson or Muhammad Ali. Right? If she meant it like that, no, she didn't mean it like that. You just say she's the best ever. But she's not. Interesting. Men and women differ physically. They process emotion differently. Usually, women process emotion better than men. Their brains work differently. Their brains are different sizes. They have different interests. Men have more interest in things, women with people. That's why children tend to play, little boys tend to play with trucks, and women with dolls, girls with dolls. You hear in the Scandinavian studies, right? Or if you look at countries in Scandinavia, and Dr. Peterson also brings this up a lot. It's a very interesting study because European studies are interesting because there isn't a lot of religious baggage there. They're not very religious people. <laughs> and they, they're ethnically very homogenous. So there's, there's incredible equality in these countries, as it were, between the sexes. And it shows that, that when people are left to their own devices, women gravitate towards traditional female occupations. And men gravitate towards traditional male occupations. There are 20 male engineers to every one female engineer in these Scandinavian countries. There are 20 uh, um, uh, teachers and caretakers and nurses. To every the fictional comes through. You can see that. It's very interesting. Gender roles are determined by biology. Women are naturally better caregivers than men. Again, that statement there will get me thrown out of a psychology, sociology, anthropology class. How do we know that well, they have breasts? That's one thing, right? That's just obvious, right? Men are more suited for manual labor. That's why uh, men have 40% more upper body strength than women on average. I saw a guy today at the U.S. Open. He hit the ball 140 miles an hour. On a serve, even the Fed was like, "Whoa, the Fed is right." He's the goat. <laughs> men deal with stress. Uh, men uh, deal with stress better, yet they have shorter lifespans. <laughs> but they process emotion in a worse way. Multiple studies have shown that the IQs of men are less predictable than that of women. Men are all over the place in the IQ. Women tend to cluster around the mean. We are different because we complete each other. The reality is men... Charles University, which is in Prague, again, you know, uh, the European studies are very, very interesting. Uh, study done on married couples, Charles University. They found that marriages in which one spouse was dominant, by dominant, I don't mean oppressive, I mean they had the final authority. 
the recognized leader in the household. The study found that marriages where one spouse was dominant um, were the happiest of marriages. And 77% of them were male dominated. So there's a good reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ar-Rijalu qawwamuna ala nisa. That men are the supporters or maintainers, men stand over women. There's a reason why Paul says in the New Testament, I don't agree with everything that Paul says. He says the head of the woman is the man, the head of man is Christ, the head of Christ is God. These weren't written, these texts were not written by misogynists trying to oppress women. They were written in accordance with reality. That leads to greater happiness according to secular studies done in 2016, 17, 18. Hierarchies work. They are part of life. Most of the time, they're based on competence, not biological factors, not power dynamics. They work in the market, they work in the workplace, in the military, they work in school, and in the household. And here's another problem. Young men are constantly being told that they are violent rapists. Now, it is true that men are a lot more violent than women. If you look at the prison population, 90 to 95 percent of prisoners are men. And again, that's because <coughs> women tend to deal with their emotions in healthier ways than men. Okay? The answer, however, is not to feminize men. It's very interesting that testosterone levels are down 30% from just 30 years ago. 30%. Men are becoming more and more effeminate. They're eating more and more soy. <laughs> Don't eat soy. <laughs> soy increases estrogen. It's given to postmenopausal women. Don't eat soy. I was taking these men vitamins for a while. And I was like, let me just look at the ingredients. First ingredient, organic soy flour. <laughs> Two pointer into the garbage. <laughs> Don't eat soy. Soy sales in 1992, soy food sales in 1992 were 300 million in the U.S. Now they're 4 billion. 4 billion. It is feminizing men. You see, masculinity is like a martial art. So, so masculinity gravitates towards risk-taking, ambition, assertiveness, competition, and physicality. It's like a martial art. It's, it can be used to murder, rape, oppress, but also to protect and defend. If men are feminized, who will check the oppressor? We need strong, highly masculine men. We need them. The answer is not to feminize them. The answer is to uh, reform the masculinity and be truly masculine. And women actually prefer masculine men. Fight what you prefer. She'll pick a woman at random. You want this guy? You know, uh, very, very, very thin with skinny jeans. Um, <laughs> you know, he's got a pink jacket on. <laughs> and a little love patch. Sorry if people have these frosted tips. Sorry if people have that. <laughs> or do you want this guy? He's got, you know, he's he's muscular and you know he's got a deep voice. He, he plays rugby. Be honest. <laughs> ah, just need to be honest. That's the problem. Now, social constructionists are taking it to even crazier levels. Now the trend is that children are seen as equal to parents in the household. There are seven, eight, and nine-year-old children with gender dysphoria demanding hormone therapy from their parents and their parents giving into the pressure. Never mind the fact that hormone therapy sterilizes children and that, that out of the small fraction of children that have gender dysphoria, 80% of them grow out of it. It's a phase that they come out of naturally. Sayyidina Ali said, childhood is a type of junoon, is a type of insanity. They're children for a reason. We don't listen to children. 
a child who wants to touch a stove, right? You don't say, well, okay, no. <laughs> but I want to be a boy. Like my daughter, four years old, like last year, and she wanted to be Minnie Mouse. So what do I do? Start pumping her with uh, mouse hormones? <laughs> and, you know, it's a new generation. They know better than us. 80% of them grow out of it. 80%. Right? And those that don't grow out of it become uh, incredibly suicidal. Can't go back. I mean, maybe you could. Oh. I'll end with two pieces of advice for Muslims in colleges and universities. Now, going back to activism, when I give you sincere advice, you can take it or leave it. Maybe you don't agree with the thing I said today. That's fine. I don't really care. And if I've offended you, don't care. <laughs> Beware of activists. This is my first piece of advice. Beware of activists. Now, tempered activism is effective. That activism without sacred ilm, without tazkiyatun nafs, right, purification of the self, is very, very dangerous. You're in college to gain knowledge, to grow intellectually, not to become these radicalized neo-Marxist activists. To paraphrase a wise man, if you're going to march down the street and shout at people and wave signs, you have to really make sure that the evil is truly outside of you and not in your own heart. Now, quite often, activists who claim to be working for our best interests as Western Muslims are actually harming us as they ignorantly or deliberately antagonize entire groups of people, the vast majority of whom are totally innocent of any wrongdoing. Their postmodern race baiting, rhetoric of power, identity politics, an obsession for earthly justice actually serves to galvanize groups of people against our Muslim community, people who otherwise would have no problems with us. And not only do they contribute to our society's polarization, they also tend to misrepresent us as they form alliances with organizations and individuals whose positions about God, and morality, and human life are disturbing, to say the very least. They are the quintessential products of the postmodernist university system. Beware of them. The Prophet ﷺ, honor the scholars. They are the inheritors of the prophets. Whoever honors uh, the scholars honors Allah and his messenger. Follow activist scholars. Activist scholars. People who have traditional training. People who are not going to do more damage than good. Second piece of advice. Form alliances with uh, and brotherhoods and sisterhoods with Christians and Jews on campus. I think it's uh, time for the people of faith, the children of Abraham, to come together. <clears throat> this is how we can change the monoculture of postmodern universities. In my opinion, in the English-speaking world, the Ahmadidat days are over. Maybe in the Farsi-speaking world there's some utility for that. We can still debate, obviously, but with sophistication and academic rigor, not with hardcore polemics, and this is obviously a Quranic imperative. But at the end of the day, we must maintain a strong sense of respect for and solidarity with the Ahlul Kitab, because they are experiencing what we experience in these universities. They embrace the God of Moses and Jesus. They honor Abrahamic morality. When we attack Jews and Christians and disrespect their beliefs, their scriptures and traditions, we are playing right into the hands of the postmoderns. They want us to eat each other. They're setting a trap for us, and we walk right into it. All this talk about banning the Bible and whatnot, you say, well, that has nothing to do with us. Soon it will. You'll see. You know, people going into homosexual people going purposely into Christian bakeries, right, and trying to run them out of business. You know? I mean, in Catholicism, marriage is a sacrament. You don't mess around with sacraments. And this is different than, like, if a black person comes into your bakery and you kick them out. Because then you're, you're totally judging them based on their physical appearance. But here it's the action that they want the baker to condone. It's an action 
It's not based on their appearance. Right? In other words, one of the Christian bankers, he said, look, if they came in and said, bake me a birthday cake, I would do it. But if you say, bake me a wedding cake, that's a sacrament. I can't violate that. I'll go to hell. I don't care what he, what he says. And this person won. He took it to the Supreme Court and he won. They won for now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I mean, I used to teach at St. Mary's College, which is a Catholic college. And Christian students would come to me all the time for advice. And I would just quote the New Testament to them. <laughs> <laughs> if the world hates you, Christ said, speaking to the disciples, if the world hates you, remember it hated me first. <laughs> That's the nature of the dunya. The ahl dunya always hate the ahl law. The geocentric, as it were, always hate the theocentric. So when apostasy increases, depression increases, despair increases, we have to give people hope, give them a sense of purpose, a goal. People nowadays are emotionally incontinent. A lot of it is due to social media addiction. Right? It's that dopamine, you know, that, that light, that little hit of dopamine. My advice is, and I practice what I preach, get off completely of Facebook. Completely get off. Get off of all social media. That's just my advice. Maybe it's not practical for you, but you know, when I was uh, on, on Facebook two hours a day, and I'm trying to answer questions, and I'm trying to be the arbitrator of debates between my friends, <laughs> it suddenly occurred to my mind, I was telling your brother earlier, it suddenly occurred to my mind, I'm not getting paid for this. <laughs> what am I doing? Yeah. It got me. <laughs> Shut it down, had a nice cup of tea, fell into a deep sleep, and never missed it. Never want to go back. So, but you know, self-control. Dr. Sachs he said that the greatest indicator of success of a person later in life is self-control as a child. Self-control. May Allah Subhanahu wa Taala give us tawfiq. We all have. Most of us have children. This is a big problem in all the houses. There are no exceptions. This is a big, big issue. Makala um, khairan. Stop here. We have about 15 minutes or so. We can maybe take some questions and more comments. So, shall we um, pass around a couple baskets with uh, pens and, and little cards? Um, if you could uh, write your question down. Um, Okay, can you, uh, first one is, can you be liberal and follow the principles of Islam at the same time? Uh, yeah, as long as, you know, as, as long as um, you don't advocate a type of belief that is clearly in violation of essential creed. <clears throat> Right. So, for example, you know, I, I don't know how Muslims can justify homosexuality. I don't know how they can justify the late term abortion. I mean, these are all liberal causes. They're the cornerstone of the Democratic Party. Um, you know, I think I think we need to come together with conservatives. Really do. I, we have so much more in common. Maybe this is not what you want to hear. But we have we have much more in common with Sarah Palin than we do with Hillary Clinton. A lot more in common. We can work with them. We can. And I'm not talking about the people of the extreme alt right, right? And I'm not talking about these extreme leftists, obviously, who have you know Antifa, things like that. I'm talking about people who are right of center, believe in God, they practice traditional morality, right? They believe in scripture. The problem with them, however, is they have a total misapprehension about us. Many of them, they think we're satanic and, you know, uh, they think we're antichrist. But a lot of them are now reaching out to us. This is what I've noticed from my teachers. You have uh, very powerful um, evangelical lobbies reaching out to some of my teachers saying, look, there was this incident, a 16-year-old boy or whatever somewhere in the United States who wanted to have hormone therapy. His parents said, no, the state removed him from the house. They're coming after our children. This is going to happen to you, because you're a Muslim. 
So I think ultimately aligning ourselves with leftists is probably a mistake. I think it's done because there's a mutual hatred of Trump, but when Trump is gone, they're going to eat each other. Uh, do Muslims have to be homophobic? So phobia means to be afraid. To quote Dr. Omar Johnson, I'm not afraid of anybody. Supposing your neighbor is a homosexual or your friend. So I think you know, maybe what you mean is the Muslims have to um, um, be unaccepting of the homosexual lifestyle. My understanding of orthodoxy, and I believe in orthodoxy, I believe in normative definition, is that homosexuality is completely inconsistent with the teachings of the Quran and the teachings of the Prophet Now, everyone's a sinner. Everybody. And there is an exception, of course, the ulama, the prophets. Right? Everyone's a sinner. Everyone needs toba. Right? So, a man who is attracted to other men is still Muslim. It's not actually haram for a man to be attracted to other men. What is haram? It's to act out on that uh, desire inclination. Just as, like I said, there are men, grown men, who have proclivities towards children. Right? The important thing is not to act out on that. Uh -huh. So if one denies that, so the difference between um, uh, if, if, if one denies Dalil Qatari, clear indication, clear injunction in the Quran and the Hadith, if they deny that, then this is kufr, they're no longer Muslim. But if one recognizes, even if one engages in the act, but they recognize that it's a sin and they make toba, they still remain within Islam. Right? Because an act does not take you out of Islam, according, at least according to the Hanafis, no act takes you out of Islam, only a denial of what made you Muslim in the first place. The only exception to that is if you violate the sacred symbols of God. Like, for example, you, you, um, you insult the Prophet wasallam or you desecrate the Kaaba, or desecrate a Mus'haf, or something like that. But you still remain within Islam. Just make Tawbah. People who have inclinations, people make mistakes, everyone makes mistakes. Don't leave Tawbah. As a student taking a philosophy course in college, saying morality is relative, no real truth, what can I do to not fall into this convincing argument? Um... Well, you can use the argument that um, even atheists, people who don't recognize God, many of them will admit that there is objective morality. Right? Um, the Quran, I, I believe, calls it al ma'ruf. Um, in Jewish tradition, it's called the Noahidic laws. I'm talking about things like murder. I'm talking about things like uh, theft. I think it's axiomatic wherever you go around the world irrespective of a person's religious belief or lack thereof. That murder is wrong, stealing is wrong, adultery is wrong, uh, wronging other people, uh, uh, oppressing other people is wrong. Right? There's something there. Right? I mean, theists would call that human nature. Right? So, um, I mean, I would certainly uh, take a course in the history of Western philosophy and, um, uh, and familiarize yourself <coughs> with different thinkers that um, would um, uh, recognize that there's an essential human nature, even if they don't recognize that there's a deity that's the source of that human nature. So it's not, you know, it's, it's not a black and white issue. Yeah. How do you raise, behave with a child family member who identifies as LGBT? Um, with compassion, um, you know, as I said earlier, there seems to be, according to many researchers, there, se there seems to be a link between childhood trauma and sexual perversion. Um, so we have to tread very lightly, you know. Uh, continue to give advice to the child. Um, uh, continue, and you know, it's, it's a difficult thing because Children are very sensitive. You don't want to sound very preachy because it might drive them further away. Right? I think the best thing you can do is continue to be compassionate to them and continue to have istiqamah upon your religion. 
Continue to pray. Make sure that they know you're praying. You know, make sure that they, they know that you're following the halal and you're staying away from the haram. If they see that and they and and uh, they they see your good character, then inshallah ta'ala, you know, they'll come out of that or they'll, they'll learn to embrace and submit to uh, uh, Islam in a fuller way because they want to imitate you. Now that's a difficult situation. The short answer is continue to be compassionate towards people, give people advice, but don't overdo it. Uh, but really with your action, be a practicing person with your action. And there are people here that uh, I know that can give much better advice on, on these types of questions. At student college, is it worth to raise our ideas and beliefs in discussion that contradict them, or is silence a better option? That's a very good question. I think if um, if you can maintain your sort of base and um, um, really feel like engaging in a classroom conversation will not lead to greater good, then I wouldn't say anything. Um, you know, in my PhD seminar classes, we're, we're, we're expected to teach the class and whatnot, give our opinions. But many of the times I just wanted to sit there and say nothing. Because I think sometimes it actually will benefit myself and others if you just stay quiet. So that's a, that's a game time decision that you have to make, right? Certainly I think if a professor um, says something that is um, uh, like something that ridicules uh, the Quran or the Sunnah or something like that, it makes you feel uncomfortable, then I think one should, with Adam, um, make some sort of comment to clarify, to let the people in the class, especially the <coughs> professor, know that you're Muslim and you're a practicing professional Muslim. Um, but that's that's something that you have to decide at the time. Sometimes silence is better. Can you please comment on Sulto's birth of the clinic with regards to his major ideas and relate that to any issues we see with modern medicine? Oh, I can't comment on that. I haven't read that text. I'm not an expert in Michelle Foucault. <laughs> what do you think is our responsibility as Muslim parents for choosing to live and raise our children? In this Western world where everything seems to be against our Muslim beliefs. I don't know if everything seems to be against your Muslim beliefs. I mean, there's still, like I said, there's still Christians and Jews out there, right, that follow traditional morality, that believe in God, believe in the prophets. Um, uh, what do you think is our responsibility? Responsibility is simply to um, convey the message. You can't force someone to embrace something in their heart, even your own child. You simply have to teach them the best that you can according to the prophetic model. And the prophetic model is one of, of gentleness. The Prophet from Allah does not strike children, he didn't even raise his voice. And one of action, of orthopraxis. The Prophet was, he was a, a doer, right? He wasn't passive. Muslim means active part active. The STEM fields have been thriving for at least for the last 30 to 40 years. How does one reconcile that with the fact that postmoderns don't recognize um, what to do away with reason? That is, yeah, I mean, they will, they will attack even science. Like I said, I mean, you might say, well, there's, you know, there are, there are axiomatic principles in science and hard sciences, even in mathematics. All of these things are under scrutiny by postmodernists. <laughs> they don't accept any of them. They'll say, for example, you know, this this theorem in math um, is just another manifestation of the evil patriarchy and a way to keep women down, keep minorities down. <laughs> Everything is fair. <clears throat> it's just a manifestation of, you know, uh, the white dominant culture and how it wants to keep people of color down. Like a math theorem. So they don't accept, you know, 
main main line the main street sign it's, it's, it's now being under attack the common argument for Muslim support LGBT community is as oppressed groups we're all in this together yeah. what is the best way to refute this um, huh? are we really oppressed no. I don't think so I mean, if you look at the history of Islam, I mean, what happened in our history, I mean, there were Muslims that were slaughtered, you know, um, Muslims that had genocide committed against them, Muslims that were exiled from different places. Um, I think we need to take, like I said, a self-audit. We're really living in now. This is really, we're living in blessing, right? And, um, you know, a lot of the a lot of the things that Muslims point to are sort of anecdotal. You hear, for example, you know, I was uh, I was in um, a Taco Bell, and somebody said, "Hey, you camel jockey!" And you know, I went home and I put it on Facebook and I blogged about it and I, and I put it on my Instagram and Twitter. You know, I mean, how many times did it actually happen? Obviously, it's a uh, it's something that is disturbing, but I'll tell you right now, from my personal experience, I and mean, if you want anecdotal evidence, uh, the most severe racism I've ever faced was in Muslim-majority countries. You can let that one marinate for a minute. <laughs> I was barred from going into certain places because I was born in a certain country. That's never happened to me in America. So are we really oppressed? Who's oppressing us? I'm not oppressed. I don't agree with that premise. Too long. That's a dissertation. <laughs> How do you advise kids to stay away from social media? <clears throat> it's so rampant. I don't know. You have to I have the same problem. I have a kid also. It, it's difficult. There has to be some engagement or else they feel like they're living in, in North Korea or something. <laughs> How can an 18-year-old college entering uh, cling to his faith? Well, there has to be some sort of traditional or formal studies, my advice is to have some sort of traditional studies before one enters into a, uh, a public university. So there's a strong foundation. And then your, your point, your purpose in college is to get your degree and get out. And, you know, maybe it's not good advice, but, you know, I wouldn't, um, probably not good advice. I would not join any clubs and <laughs> I would not really hang out with I work better <laughs> by myself. Uh, I was part of a gang in high school called ABM, all by myself. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, it's not good to isolate yourself either. But you don't need a lot of friends. You can have one good friend. And that's all you need. One friend. Right? Then that's fine. Um, so uh, get in and get out. Get your degree. You know, you're going to have to take these elective courses in social sciences. You're going to hear a lot of this type of thing. Right? Like I said, use your judgment. You can choose to engage if you feel that there's some merit to doing that, or you can sit in the back and sort of get the work done and get out. All religions claim to be Loban. How do we explain to our kids that Islam is the one, the only true religion? <sighs> well, you have to be learned in um, several disciplines. We have to know our scripture. We have to know history. We have to know other scriptures. We have to know a comparative theology. This is a whole uh, curriculum that you have to become familiar with. 
because you know kids aren't that stupid, even though childhood is a type of insanity. <laughs> you know, you know, if, if it's just sort of lip service, you know, this is the true religion. Okay, uh, you know, uh, the Quran is the word of God. And a lot of times, it's you know, the, sort of the uncle generation, um, because back home. You know, there was no internet, everyone was Muslim, basically, all the questions were about fiqh. But nowadays, you know, in America, there's internet, they're looking things up online, the questions are about, is there a God? Not, how do I pray to God? Is there a God? Not, what does this ayah mean? Is this the word of God? Right? That becomes difficult. And so, as parents, we might have to go back to school, as it were, build our foundation, to be able to and and we have to we have to have our stuff together with these kids because you know ninety eight percent of what they hear they're not going to tell you they'll phrase it a little bit differently sort of get your your answer um, but we have to we have to be able to give answers but we have to be able to read that right and give substantive answers uh, that speaks to the very sort of intention that's in their mind that's a difficult thing to do. Um, but it takes a lot of learning in that area. You know, there's truth in other religions. I would also stress that, right? I mean, certainly Isa is a prophet of God. There are stories in the Quran that confirm things in the New Testament. But I wouldn't be this sort of ex rigid exclusivist. We're not perennialists. We're not this idea that all the religions are basically the same, and there's no supersessionism. In other words, the Quran does not cancel the ahkam of the previous. Uh, religions, we're not of that position. Um, Islam is the uh, greatest manifestation of the truth. However, there is truth in other religions, even in things like Hinduism and Buddhism that we can't really deny. <clears throat> so I would sort of abandon this uh, methodology of rigid exclusivism, right? Because again, it sort of it puts in the mind of the child this idea of supremacy. My parents think they're better than everyone else. You know, they tweet, my parents are homophobic, transphobic, Muslim supremacists who want to institute Sharia law in America. And uh, look how oppressed and poor I am. Somebody please liberate me with your Marxism. Where are you, Karl Marx? He's dead. That's it. We ask you, O Allah, to uh, accept uh, all of our actions um, that are sincerely done for you and those that are not, not sincerely done for you. O Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we ask you to increase our knowledge. We ask you to, uh, to, to benefit us from gatherings like this. We ask you to remove from our hearts uh, any type of, of rancor, any type of enmity that we have towards any other person. We ask you to feed for us to be able to deliberate, and debate, and get to the truth of things, the objective truth, and to embrace that truth. We ask you for the ability of the Tawfiq to be able to see the truth, embrace it, and see falsehood and reject it. While also in the Nizam, that because of Ilal Ladin Ahamu wa 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 